Kelly and I'll get us kicked off. So welcome everyone, we're here today for our session Schoolwide Wellness and we're focused on staff, partners and families. My name is Dr. Christina Bourbet and I'll introduce myself further in a moment. I wanted to thank you for being here. Uh, this is a part, part two um, in a two part series, um, but each one works independently. I just wanted to flag it for folks in case you weren't with us last week. Um, for those of you who were, thanks for coming back. We have a bunch of new content to cover today, but before I get into that, I wanted to go through our introduction slides. I wanted to um, give acknowledgement to our funders, um, SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, um, who is funding this no-cost learning opportunity through the Mental Health Technology Transfer Center Network. Um, and as part of participating in that, I'm going to introduce our center um, in just a moment, but I wanted to just flag for you all, if you haven't heard me say it before, um, we are so grateful to SAMHSA for being able to offer you this opportunity. And what they ask us for in exchange is to ask you all to complete a very short evaluation. Um, so I'm just flagging that for you right now. At the end of today's session, I'm gonna uh, provide a link in the chat and it really takes like less than two minutes. I'm gonna actually try and hold some time at the end of the session so we won't go right to time. Um, I'll carve out some time at the end for you to stick around and complete that. Um, if you're leaving on the hour, because I know some people um, won't be able to stay for the, for the full 90 minutes, but if you're leaving on the hour, um, we'll have that in the chat um, at around one o'clock if you're Eastern Standard Time, so that you can grab that before you have to head off to your next thing. Again, it allows us to tell SAMHSA that we have people showing up for these sessions um, and get your feedback and your experience. Um, and then SAMHSA continues to offer these um, no-cost opportunities. And we get to do that, as I said, through the Mental Health Technology Transfer Center. And we are here at the Southeast MHTTC, located at Rollins School of Public Health and Emory University. And we serve eight states in the Southeast. Um, and we make these learning opportunities available to everyone. So you may not be in the Southeast, but welcome wherever you are. We're so glad that you could be here today. Um, the Southeast MHTTC has quite a number of resources. Uh, and so this is one of them. We're doing our live virtual, um, but we have uh, a whole library full of uh, products as well as recorded webinars that you may wanna check out. And you can um, see the links in the chat for how to get to our webpage so you can access those. So really grateful to my team today for the support. Um, from our Southeast MHTTC, we have Kelly and we have Josie supporting today. You might see them putting things in the chat and I'm so grateful um, for them helping me with this um, technical aspect. And then we have a full team at the Rollins School of Public Health who are helping create these learning opportunities. Um, and I get to be part of that team. I am a senior advisor on their school mental health team and school mental health is something I've been passionate about for a long time. I was previously director of the Pacific Southwest MHTTC, and before that, I was project director for the Now is the Time um, TA Center that supports Project Aware grantees, Healthy Transition grantees, and Recast grantees. Uh, and so, really, you know, I come to the table with a, a commitment to supporting people who are supporting our young people in schools. Um, and so, I'm so grateful to all of you. Um, and the work that I do is really here um, to be your champion. Um, to really make sure that you're getting what you need so that you feel supported in the work that you're doing. Uh, and so that's part of what we're going to be focused on today. I want to take a minute um, and talk through what are our learning objectives. Um, so today what we're focused on is strengthening the practices that mitigate stress and improve morale of our school staff. We're going to leverage strategies to support the well-being of yourself and your colleagues. And then we're gonna select and use resources that shape school climate and culture for the benefit of all adults who are supporting our students. That's gonna include staff, community partners, and families, okay? So really thinking about all adults on campus and how can we build wellness um, for the entire community. A lot of times we're focused on how we're supporting our students and I like to make sure we're balancing that out with how we're supporting our adults on campus. So let's take a look at how we have today organized. Um, so we're gonna start with just kind of a lay of the land. So what does wellness look like in schools right here, right now? I feel like it's just a dynamic situation. Um, so we're gonna take a look at some of the factors that kind of always come into play. And then we'll also look at what are some of the current circumstances that are impacting wellness. Um, and then I wanna talk about climate and culture of wellness. So we'll spend some time exploring 
um, what we mean by that, and then look at how we can start shaping a collective care culture on our campus. And we'll look at that um, in three different ways. So I'm gonna talk about it in terms of how do we use data-driven decision-making for wellness? We're gonna talk about it in terms of how do we establish policy and procedure for wellness? And then the third one will be around strategies um, to make sure that we're, we're achieving effectively achieving wellness outcomes. And then I wanna make sure that we end today um, on a high note, really kind of thinking about what is possible? What, um, what can we do to ensure and instill and infuse wellness school-wide? So today we're heavily focused on adults, but really that's part of the bigger picture of making sure um, ourselves, our colleagues, um, our allies and then our students are experiencing wellness in educational settings, all right? Um, so I know that um, we have a few folks um, who may be adding to the chat and I wanted to just let folks know that you can monitor the chat uh, for the links that I'm gonna be talking about for some of the prompts that we're gonna be discussing. Um, I also just wanted to check in a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, so when you registered for the session, you got a unique link. If you're borrowing someone else's link because they forwarded it to you, you may be showing up under someone's name that is not your own. So I wanted to remind folks that you can um, highlight your own um, Zoom box and in the um, corner, you'll see three dots icon. And if you click on those three dots in your box, it will let you rename. And so if you could go ahead and make sure that you rename to something that reflects you and your identity, that would really help our team track our participation today. Um, and then I also wanted to let you know that I will be glancing at the chat, but I still don't read chat and present simultaneously. <laughs> so um, I'm going to look at that uh, and I will try and uh, uh, respond to questions and um, remark on comments, but Josie and Kelly are really helping me out there. Uh, so I just wanted to let you know that we will have some discussion. I will ask folks to add input to the chat today to make this more interactive. Um, and at certain points, we'll have the opportunity if you want to unmute and share your experiences, uh, we'll be encouraging that. That's our plan for today. Um, so let me go ahead and move us forward. I want to talk about um, wellness here and now. So in this section, what I want to do is make sure that we're reviewing what is actually influencing the wellness of school staff and other adults on campus? So we're gonna look at factors that shape stress. We're gonna look at factors that shape resilience. And then we're gonna talk about why, what's the value? Why is it important to build wellness for our campus community? Um, sometimes that seems obvious, but I think there's gonna be some pieces in there where you're like, oh, I didn't even realize that that was impacted. Um, and then we'll follow this current session, uh, section, wellness here and now, um, where we're gonna look at ways that you may already be building wellness and then new opportunities where you can expand um, or add effectiveness to initiatives that you already have in, underway. Um, and so my key focus, I'm gonna just flag this for you now, because I know a lot of you have a lot going on. It's the beginning of the school year. This is a great time to be thinking about school-wide wellness. And I bet you're probably multitasking or thinking about the next thing that you have to do after this. So as I go through the content, um, what I'm gonna do is try and make this as easy for you to grab and go with as possible. And so I will verbally kind of cue you where it's like, hey, if you're gonna pay attention to one thing, just listen up right here uh, and kind of give you the grab and go. And then I'll follow that with like a little bit of a deeper dive. Uh, and so for folks who wanna know more, um, I'll follow up my kind of grab and go with some additional description or content or more resources. Um, I'll also be pointing you in the direction of additional resources that we have at the Southeast MHTTC if you want to know more. So that's my plan. In this section, we're talking about what are the factors that are impacting our wellness. Uh, so I wanted to put this in a context that may feel familiar. I think a lot of you are um, education involved or education adjacent. And so you may be really familiar with the terms risk and protective factors. Um, risk and protective factors is something that we often talk about when we're thinking about our vulnerable youth. Um, but what I wanna ask you to do is kind of translate that. Think about it in terms of yourself. Think about it in terms of your colleagues and other adults on campus that you're um, engaged with in your school community. 
And so we know that our wellness, our sense of well-being, um, is impacted negatively by stress and positively by resilience. And that kind of maps onto those traditional risk and protective factors. Um, and just like in all of that research, we know um, that the more protective factors we have in place, um, the more we're mitigating the impacts of stress, right? The more we're tapping into a sense of resilience. Let's talk a little bit more about that. Um, so when we're thinking about stress, we know that that can really have an impact on our wellness, our wellness and our well-being. And what you see here is, um, is a, defi a formal definition of what we mean by stress, but my hunch is um, that many of you have a real good sense um, of what stress feels like, um, especially what stress feels like in the workplace. And if you wanna put some examples in the chat of stressors in your workplace, um, now would be a great time, really just kind of day to day, what are the things that feel hard, that feel challenging, um, that might be activating or triggering of you, what feels like it's a threat to your ability to do good work. Um, so go ahead and let us know kind of what are some of the stressors that are coming up for you. And I'm gonna talk through what we have seen in the statistics in terms of stressors impacting adults on campus. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, you know, a lot of this you might be, as I presented to you, thinking about in terms of your role on campus. What I'd like you to encourage, what I would encourage you to do is look at it from all perspectives of adults on campus, right? So any of these stressors are impacting our teachers, our school counselors, our principals, our superintendents, our parents and caregivers, our partners in the community. Um, and we're looking at things like workforce conditions. Um, so attrition, demands of the job, political controversy. I just wanted to say a few things about those. Um, so just to put our current landscape in context, I was looking at some of the uh, data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics and what they released in 2018 predicted that between, or sorry, between 2018 and 2026, that 270,000 primary and secondary teachers would leave the occupation. So they predicted this in 2018, that within eight years, we would lose 270,000 teachers in the field. Um, what we found from UCLA Health in 2022 was that 300,000 public school teachers left the education field in two years between 2020 and 2022. So we know why those things are happening, but that kind of turnover has huge impacts for every adult on campus who's engaged with young people. And so kind of thinking about the impact that has on our remaining school staff um, and how that ripple effects out to other adults um, who want good things for young people. I also wanted to just touch on um, political controversy and some shifts in our current landscape that have made topical issues um, debated and navigated by school staff, families, and community organizations. So again, more than ever, we have folks on school campuses um, who need to respond to these types of political controversies that are coming up in our communities. And then we have the standard demands of the job, right? So under all of these circumstances, right, we're also having these um, need to balance instructional time, exam requirements, and other responsibilities. Um, and so thinking about all of that impacting adults on campus and the ripple effect it has to other adults supporting young people is an important consideration when we wanna think about the stressors that folks are facing. I also wanted to mention public health conditions. So one is still kind of COVID-19 and where we are with that. Um, it's endemic at this point, the impact that it continues to have on, um, on absenteeism, on, um, other kind of political controversies that schools are gonna have to navigate. Uh, the, the lasting impact of the 2020 to 2023 pandemic and where you are in terms of your own recovery from that experience, where your family is, where your students are, where your students' families are. So everybody's kind of still figuring out and navigating what is the new normal post pandemic. Uh, and so I wanted to just acknowledge that as well as a related but also independent crisis that our children and youth are facing with regard to mental health. Um, so more and more um, uh, prioritization uh, in response to the need for mental health and behavioral health supports of our students. Okay, 
that was a lot of heavy stuff. And I wanted to just make sure that we covered some of the pieces and I can see um, that we have a lot of um, stressors that you all are naming in the chat. And so thank you for sharing those. And I wanted to just take a breath and take a moment to say, there's a lot going on right now. And so when we think about our well being and we think about why is it feeling so hard? Why is it feeling so heavy? Um, we have good reason to be experiencing those responses because stress is really putting a lot of pressure on our resilience. Um, but I do wanna spend the rest of our session today thinking realistically about how we can mitigate those stressors. So I'm gonna say that again, um, I wanna think realistically about how we can mitigate some of those stressors in our, in our education settings. Uh, and so this isn't a sugar coating, this isn't a rose colored gla glasses situation, um, but looking at what we know is likely to offset some of these impacts. So thinking about, about our scale, um, our balance of well being, um, we know that um, we have this other side to it, which is resilience, right? And so resilience may be a familiar term for you when you think about your young people. Um, it's a lot. Of, a lot of the literature on our positive youth development focuses on um, strengths-based resilience building. Um, resilience is our ability to bounce back, right? So our ability to be flexible, our ability to adapt, um, especially under difficult circumstances. And so I feel like this is a really important thing to think about when we're thinking about ourselves and when we're thinking about um, the, the adult community of folks supporting students on campus. What's their resilience like? And how can we promote those protective factors that boost resilience, that invest and build resilience so that um, our wellness and our well being can flourish? So, just like we talk about um, resilience as kind of that extension of protective factors that buoy us in a storm, I want to introduce a new term, or maybe new to you. Um, kind of a, a specific type of resilience and thinking about it in terms of compassion resilience. Uh, and so this term for me is the flip side of this buzzword that we keep hearing about, which is compassion fatigue, right? So compassion fatigue, raise your hand if you've ever felt compassion fatigue. It's real, right? We're there to give, we're there to serve. And so sometimes we just feel drained. We feel like there's no more gas in the tank. Uh, and, and when we talk about compassion fatigue, I see so many people resonate with that term. People are like, oh, there's a name for it. Yes, that's what I have. I'm so tired because I've been caring and caring and caring. Um, and so what we want to build is compassion resilience to mitigate that sense of burnout and that sense of fatigue. And that's a reservoir that we can draw on. And that's a lot of what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, is how are we building compassion resilience? And more specifically, how are we building that systemically? Um, last week's session focused a lot on making sure that individually we were um, infusing our own compassion resilience at the beginning of the school year. Um, so we're talking a lot about self-care strategies and um, what we could do with our colleagues. What we're here to do today is really think about school-wide um, we're focused on adults, yes, but we're also focused on how can we build an infrastructure for compassion resilience so that um, there's a methodical way of ensuring our reservoir of compassion is available and accessible to all adults on campus. Let's take a look at what we mean. Um, so here are some of the benefits um, of compassion resilience. Um, Sorry, I'm gonna back up just, well, actually, no, I'm not gonna back up. I'm gonna let you look at some of the benefits of compassion resilience, but I also just wanted to put it in context of what is compassion resilience for folks in the educational field. So for education, compassion resilience looks like the ability to maintain our physical and emotional and mental well being using energy productively while compassionately identifying and addressing the stressors that are the barriers to our own success and to our students' learning. So again, I wanna just point out there, that's a realistic assessment, right? So it's finding that balance. We wanna be able to use our energy productively and also have a realistic assessment of the barriers. The second thing that defines 
compassion resilience in the education field is identifying and addressing the barriers to caregivers and parents and colleagues um, and being able to partner together on behalf of children. And then the third is identifying, preventing, and minimizing compassion fatigue within ourselves. Okay. So thinking about that, I wanna just check in with folks and see, does this sound familiar, compassion resilience? You may not have heard the term before, but you're probably familiar with the practice. Okay? And so when we think about compassion resilience, I wanna get a sense from you all, right? Compassion, you know, how does compassion fatigue show up for you? How does compassion resilience show up for you in your role? Because we know that compassion fatigue and compassion resilience impacts you differently depending on your personal history, on your identity, on your social position in, and your affiliation with the school. So whatever your experience is may be different than someone else's experience. That said, we also have this opportunity to think about it as a collective resilience. And we'll talk more about that later in the session. But first, I want to just make sure that we're all on board, right? We wanna improve the compassion resilience of all adults who are supporting our students. We want the benefits that we see here, right? Staff retention and productivity, decreases in employee absenteeism, decreases in employee healthcare costs, strengthening partnerships, increasing parent involvement on campus. All of these things are benefits of infusing compassion resilience. Um, we wanna make sure that we're benefited, we have the benefits of adults on campus who are consistent, who are accessible, who are regulated, and who are supportive of each other and of the youth on campus. So that's what we're aiming for. So I wanna ask you now, we're gonna do a poll in just a moment, but think about it. Are you on board for this? Maybe you're already engaged in building compassion resilience and you just have a different name for it. Um, but I wanted to just point out, you know, we're thinking more globally now, we're thinking school-wide. And so when you think about, yeah, I want compassion resilience. I'm doing compassion resilience, Christina. I wanted to just take a pause and, and take do kind of like a short inventory. So who is actually responsible for ensuring school-wide wellness for your staff, your school partners, and your parents? So I'm gonna ask you, Kelly, if you could pull up the poll for us now. Um, and so go ahead and take a moment. I'm gonna read you the choices here. Who's responsible? Is it the individual person? Is it the leadership at your school? Is it all of us? Is it, I don't know, but it's not me. Is it, ah, there's a team for that. I forget the acronym for it. Um, or is it some person you know who does it on top of their regular job just because they care that much? Right, so I wanna go ahead and ask you to submit your, your response. And this is a little bit tongue in cheek, but I'm asking you to respond anyway, because um, we're gonna talk through what this actually looks like. Talk through what this actually looks like. Um, and Kelly, I can't see where we are with responses at this point. We're at 69%. Um, oh, great. Okay, let's just give it another couple seconds. So who's responsible for school-wide wellness? select any of these that seem like it might be true for your um, school community. And we can go ahead and close the tab and share results. Ah, oh, you guys are the best, I love this. All of us, yeah, we all have a role in that, it's true. Um, I like that no one thinks that it's one person's job, although I can see that a couple people know that it's only one person doing it. Um, and hopefully by the end of the session today, we're gonna have more of a sense of, it's a leadership role as well. Because when we're building systems, when we're building infrastructure, um, having strong leadership and leadership that's committed um, to doing effective school employee wellness is really gonna make an impact. But yes, we all have a role in this. And let's talk more about what that looks like. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and move us forward um, to our next section. So in this section, I wanna talk about school climate and school culture. And I'm gonna tie this into our school wellness conversation. Um, but before I do, I just kind of wanna set the stage. So we know there be the, that there are these common denominator experiences of stress and resilience on campus. So that's influencing the well-being of all adults on campus, really kind of shaping what things look like in terms of well-being. 
Um, but in the context of education, the question of who is supporting school-wide wellness might be discussed under other terms. So sometimes you might hear about it in terms of school mental health and thinking about the mental health of everyone on campus. It might be talked about in terms of school climate. So positive school climate is a term that a lot of us in education or in adjacent roles are familiar with. So positive school climate, positive school climate, there's lots of initiatives and resources around that. Um, less so, but growing is um, the reference to school culture. Um, so that might be something that you use in your school setting or your education setting, or it might be something that you haven't adopted yet. Uh, it, as we're kind of talking through this next batch of slides, any of these are contributors to well being. And we're going to think about them. I would just want to take pause here and say um, that a lot of times when we're talking about any of these things, the focus is on our students. Rightly so, that's who we're there to serve. And we want the well-being of our young people because our mission is to have good outcomes for our students. But I wanna make a case here as we talk through this content that the well-being of our students is going to be heavily contingent on the well-being of the adults on campus and the adults involved in that young person's education. So we're thinking about here all of the adults on campus. We know that any kind of School climate, school culture is dynamic. Uh, we know that it's not fixed, it's malleable, and as it changes, so do aspects of the adult experience. So a sense of the adult's connectedness, which could look like staff turnover. It could look like levels of parent um, engagement and involvement in school um, or parent detachment or lack of involvement in school. And we know that any of the factors influencing this are going to fluctuate over the course of the year and how they land for any given individual varies, like we said, depending on their personal history. Um, so that's kind of the high level overview. I wanna dig a little bit deeper and we're gonna, I wanna get a sense from you what school climate and school culture looks like, but I wanna distinguish between the two for a moment and I wanna use an example here. Um, so school climate is important, school culture is important. Right? The quality and character of school life, yes, <laughs> I care about that. The way teachers and other staff members work together, their beliefs and values and assumptions that they share, I care about that also. And I kind of think about it as like you can't have one without the other. And the example that I wanted to give here is based on where I live. I live in California. Um, and in California, we have eucalyptus trees that are not indigenous to the region, and we have redwood trees that are indigenous to the region. Um, and I'm not an arborist, so this is just my personal observation about trees, although I did look into this a little bit. And what we know is our eucalyptus trees, which are abundant, especially on the central coast where I live, um, are um, beautiful. They are tall. We can see them everywhere. They are glorious. They have very shallow root systems. So anytime there's any kind of storm, the eucalyptus trees just fall down all over the place, right? So on houses, on power lines, across roads. And so when we see them, right, they look like they're thriving and flourishing, but they don't have a deep or wide root system to hold them in place, right? So their resilience in the face of any sort of struggle um, gets impacted right away and they tip over. Our redwoods, which are indigenous, um, have root systems that hold them in place. It is very rare that you see a redwood fall over under kind of natural duress circumstances. So a windstorm, a rainstorm, even when the soil kind of starts to get too saturated, they hold on tight. And so it's rare that we see any sort of um, disaster caused by redwood trees falling over. And that's kind of what I mean when we're thinking about school climate and school culture. Right? We wanna plant something that's going to both flourish above ground and be deeply rooted um, in the ground. And so as we're talking about school wellness and school well-being, we wanna really think about school climate and school culture. Um, so I'm gonna pause there in my example <laughs> and ask you for examples uh, from your setting. So when you think about school climate and school culture, um, what is what is this? What does it look like in your context? And I want to invite folks to add this um, to add this to the chat. When you think about school climate, school culture, what does that look like 
participate, just examples of how that shows up in the spaces that you're in. And I also wanna invite folks, if you'd like to raise your hand, um, and then I can um, invite you to unmute and share if you wanna give any examples of what school climate or school culture looks like where you are. And that could be things that you appreciate about it or things that define it that you don't prefer. And if no one's gonna share, I'm gonna share my examples of climate and culture that I'm familiar with from the educational settings that I'm in. Um, so I'll give it just another minute. I promise you this is gonna be interactive. <laughs> so I'm counting on you all to let me know kind of what shape this takes uh, where you're coming from. So one of the things that I have noticed um, in terms of school climate is how folks greet each other. Right? So when we look at climate and culture, how adults on campus greet each other, I think really reflects a lot about what is the culture on campus. So saying good mornings, saying goodbyes, saying hellos as you're passing each other or not, right? If you're in a school environment where things are so strapped that I don't even have bandwidth or energy to, out, to give out the courtesy of a hello when I pass a colleague in the hallway or when I come into the break room, um, that says something about the climate and culture. Um, so that's just a couple of examples. Um, you know, how people are showing up for each other. If someone, you know, in these times where we're so limited with school staff, um, if someone's willing to, um, to help out in a classroom so I can step out for a moment um, and supervise kids so that I can um, use the restroom. I think those types of examples of like, okay, we're all, we all have it tough here, but how can we help distribute the load, right? How can I show up for my colleagues? So again, that kind of reciprocity or that lack of reciprocity are parts of um, defining our school climate and school culture. Right? And so part of the pieces that I wanna bring out here, and I do see some folks um, adding to the chat. So yes, giving gratitudes and appreciations. We're gonna talk about that later in the session, but yeah, those kind of simple acknowledgements can be really impactful and create this sense of being seen um, by each other on campus. Um, especially being respected uh, for the work that you're doing on campus, the types and tones of communication. Uh, so transparency uh, between adults on campus about, you know, hey, we're gonna try this new initiative. Let me walk you through the steps of it. And here's where we want to get your input and your feedback. That's a very different vibe of transparency than adults on campus who never know what protocol to follow or what's gonna be enforced or not enforced or um, what the new, the latest and greatest policy or shiny object is that we're supposed to be prioritizing. Um, so again, those types of factors really influence uh, what individuals experience on campus, what we collectively experience on campus, and then how we respond. Are we responding from our compassion resilience, right, that reservoir, um, or are we topped out? because there hasn't been anything um, to mitigate that stress and infuse that resilience. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and move us forward. I wanna dig in a little bit and talk about what do we, um, what do we get out of a focus on positive school climate and culture, right? So as I was alluding to in my examples, we know that when there's positive school climate and culture, we get things like job satisfaction, a sense of self-efficacy, employee retention, reduction in burnout, including emotional exhaustion, and we see outcomes in terms of positive student achievement. So I just, I don't wanna to spend too much time here, but I wanna point out that there is research that shows there is value to positive school climate. I feel like sometimes when we're talking about positive school climate, it's all kind of like warm and fuzzy. And it's like, great, Christina, that sounds terrific, but I don't have time for that. And I, what I'm offering to folks is this is a pivot point. It's a way to kind of shift the mindset and say there is actual literal dollar value associated with strategies that build positive school climate. We're gonna talk about how to measure that value um, a little bit later on today, but I wanna highlight that, um, that for folks who are having difficulty either wrapping your own head around why this matters, or if you want information 
um, to share with folks who you need buy-in from, um, allies that you might wanna make in this effort for school-wide positive school climate that focuses on adults as well as students. We're gonna give you um, some of the statistics today that really show there are positive impacts associated with building an infrastructure for well-being. Um, and so thinking about some of the factors that um, shape what positive school climate and culture look like, I saw some examples in the chat and I wanna look at um, what we know from the research, right? So what contributes, what influences whether there's positive school climate and culture? Well, leadership does, right? The style and nature of leadership can really shape the, the norms and values and beliefs on campus. Um, and then we can also look at um, collegial relationships. So how adults on campus connect to their peers, connect to all other staff on campus. Uh, so the nature of those relationships as well as how folks connect. So collaboration is a big one. Communication is a big one. And so looking at all of these as examples um, of the benefits we know um, that across all of the research studies, these types of factors really shape positive school climate and culture. And so what I wanna do now um, and throughout the rest of the session is talk about, you're like, okay, cool, Christina, like got it, but what do we do with that? Um, so what I wanna do for the rest of the session is really give you um, some key pieces that you can walk away with that will help you tools um, and tips that will really help you shape any of these areas. And you might be really strong in one, um, you might not be ready to tackle all. And so again, I kind of want to give you different um, grab and go opportunities where you can take tools and resources and bring them back. And I'm going to make them as accessible as possible, as easy to implement as possible, and as customizable as possible, right? So that you have something that's really going to make sense for the bandwidth that you have and the setting that you're in and the outcomes that you want. Um, so I'm going to move us ahead. Um, because we're going to shift and think about, okay, positive school climate and school culture, how are we tying that back to what we mean by school-wide well-being? And so I want to talk about this principle of collective care, and that's what the next um, few slides are going to be about. Building positive school climate and culture are an aspect of collective care. So we are creating an environment that's what we're doing. We're creating an environment together on campus that supports both the individual and the group level of well being. So, when we think about wellness, we need to consider how we support resilience to optimize resilience. Um, and so, it's that individual level opportunity and responsibility, or it's that shared organizational level, right? So Sometimes we think about that in terms of self-care and collective care. I'm gonna talk more about that in just a moment. But in this section, we're gonna address expanding on the premise of school climate and school culture so that we can develop an approach to wellness that addresses the individual level need through shared norms for supporting ourselves, each other, and our students, right? So that's how it's all coming together in a more cohesive collective care for school-wide well-being. Um, before, before I move on to the next slide in this section, I want to just re-anchor us, just a touchstone, um, that a lot of times, especially kind of given the demands that we're individually facing, it's so easy to process this um, just from our point of view, right? The, the parts that align with your experiences, resonate with you, and then the parts where you're like, that's not me, I don't know what you're talking about, Christina. And so what I'd like to encourage you to do as we kind of go through the next two sections is to think about how does this land for me um, and think about, okay, how might this land for somebody else that I work with, right? And whether that's somebody in the front office, whether it's um, somebody in the cafeteria, whether it's someone in the classroom or someone in the wellness center or in the health center, whether it's a parent who's coming onto campus, think about our community partners, right? And so, you know, a lot of times I, I'm, working in schools. Other times I have a role as a community partner who's trying to get on campus. Um, and so I have a lot of sympathy for our community-based organizations who want to be a resource 
uh, to the adults on campus and to the students. Because a lot of times, especially when things are stressful in an educational environment, it feels like those doors are closed to our community partners. And so part of building this collective care is to be inclusive of all of our champions on campus. Um, let's take a look at kind of some of the distinction. When we're getting into the collective care model, I wanna make sure that we have a clear understanding of self-care and of collective care, because I feel like both of these terms are coming up a lot, especially self-care. I feel like that is just the buzzword of the last three years is self-care, self-care, self-care. Um, and so I wanted to spend a little bit of time distinguishing between the two and showing you how they're connected. Um, let's take a look at what we mean by individual level care, right? So um, when we refer to strategies that individuals can engage in to promote their own wellness, right? So these are things that individuals can engage in to promote their own wellness. It's a part of, but it's distinct from the collective care model because in um, self-care, there's this sense um, or sorry, in, when we think about collective care, what we're shifting to is an ethos of shared engagement in care for individuals and the group. So it's not just about me, it's about us. And for schools and organizations, it's often only discussed in terms of caring for ourselves, but not, care, not building a system of care. Sometimes that feels too big, too unwieldy. It's just easier to be like, hey, you know what's great? Meditation, go do that. Um, and what we want to do is move away from that and think about how can we create policies and protocols and environments where there is a value, a shared value around care and caring for each other. So for folks who are like, listen, Christina, I don't need one more new thing. I want to promise you that collective care is the word that I'm using today, but you probably already have a word for it. If you're not using collective care, you might be using words like trauma informed. Right, or trauma responsive schools. Um, and so um, anything around our school mental health language, wellness, well being that focuses on um, building these systems where it's not just handing off the individual, um, but really kind of building in an infrastructure of support so that the individual can care for themselves and the organization can care for the individuals in it and itself. Um, so that's the shift that I'm that I'm moving you towards when we think about self-care versus collective care. But again, I'm not asking you to adopt a shiny new object or shift paradigms or have a new framework. A lot of this is things you're already doing. And just for the gen sake of generic language, I'm um, using the umbrella of collective care. Okay. Um, and I wanted before I move on and talk more about collective care, I want to just acknowledge. Um, that I've seen more and more a lot of pushback against the concept of self-care, especially when it's a standalone approach to wellness. Um, specifically, there's been a consistent call for organizations to share in the responsibility of wellness. And when considering resources for self-care practice, I'm encouraging you to integrate that into a constellation of wellness supports inclusive of systems and policies that are shaping the well-being of the entire school community. So just as a real world example, so if you're like, what are you talking about, Christina? Like, break it down for me. This is an example of a shift from self-care to a collective care model. And hopefully this resonates with a lot of you, but as a real world example, educating school staff, adults on campus about the benefits you get, the benefits to your mental health of walking, right? So a lot of times we just you know, have a flyer, or we have a handout, or we have a theme in our staff meeting, and you're like, hey, look at all this research that shows the benefits to our mental health if we just go for a walk. So self-care, you should do a walk during your lunch break. Right? That's one approach, and that's a self-care focused or self-care standalone approach versus any campuses where we have a whole school walk. Um, so school walk, where we walk the campus loop together, everyone, adults and students, um, 1 p.m. every Wednesday. Right? Really simple, but concrete example of a shift to a collective care model where it says, I'm not just saying, hey, this is going to be good for you, so go do that. I'm creating an environment on campus where taking care of ourself is a priority. Right? And I'm allocating time and I'm designating an activity that allows people to engage in it and allows people to engage in it together. 
Um, so that's that, that's kind of the example that I wanted to share with you. I also wanted to give you some additional resources if you want to go super deep on this. Um, in August 2021, we had as part of this broader um, wellness series, a session that really focused on how we build a collective care model. Right? And in that session, and, and this is, um, I think Kelly will be dropping in just a moment, she'll drop those links um, to this resource for you. We have the recorded uh, webinar on it, as well as all of the resources for it. But in this particular um, session, what we focused on was asking, what components do we need in the foundation of collective care to be successful? And what infrastructure do we put on top of that foundation? Um, and so I wanted to just bring your attention to this. I'm not going to go deeply into it, but if this is something you're like, yes, I need to know more about this, take a look at this part of the series. Um, what we talked about building were supportive workplace relationships, fair treatment, staff feeling effective through experiencing success at work, and effective communication from managers. So you can see that that ties into um, what we discussed earlier in terms of influencers of positive school climate and school culture, right? That communication, that leadership, we're gonna talk about it um, more and more in terms of our sense of connection to each other on campus. Um, but before we go um, more deeply into that, right? Um, I wanted to just clarify that a top-down leadership modeling, normalizing and promoting of self-care, right? Is what we're aiming for. It's a different approach than just training staff to go take care of themselves. Um, so I wanna um, get a sense from you in your school communities, which adults in your school community are engaged in your current wellness approach. So be honest, be realistic. You know, if you wanted to give yourself a rating, who is actually really meaningfully engaged in, a, in your current wellness approach? And select all that apply here. Kelly has opened the poll for us. Are your school administrators involved? Are your teachers involved? Are your aides involved? Do you have your school mental health providers like your counselors, your social workers, your psychologists, are they engaged? Classified staff, um, parents, grandparents, caregivers, volunteers, community-based partners, contractors. When you think about like, yes, we're doing it, who is actually doing it, right? And getting a sense of um, that, that map of who's, who's engaged, who does our outreach actually touch, and then who actually participates in our current wellness approaches on campus. Um, so take a few minutes and think that through. And again, you may realize like, oh, I forgot about that person. You may realize like, oh, wow, we really are um, sending out that communication in a manner that's very inclusive. Uh, Kelly, how many folks do we have responding at this point? We're just over 40%. Okay. Um, we're going to just take another five seconds and I'll ask you to go ahead and close the poll. And then we can look at results together. And I think this should be like a good indicator of where do we have work to do to make sure that we're, we're, um, that we're creating an environment where those shared beliefs, those shared values um, are inclusive of all adults that are supporting young people. And I know you might be like, Christina, there's no way we can do this. It's not a one size fits all. I promise before the end of the session, you're gonna have tools and strategies um, for how to make this an inclusive experience. Um, Kelly, can you show us the results from that? Great, okay. So I definitely see a high representation of our school mental health staff. Um, and I want to just give a shout out um, for those of you who identify, um, who are participating today, who identify as school mental health providers, counselors, social workers, therapists, um, program coordinators, psychologists, psychiatrists. I want to just acknowledge that a lot of times when we think about school employee or we think about adult adults on campus and well-being, that this falls on our shoulders. So they're like, hey, you're the mental health person, like you should lead this wellness initiative. Um, and I wanna just pause and ask all of you to consider, you know, these are folks who, yes, it's in their wheelhouse and also probably have a really full plate uh, addressing the wellness needs of students on campus. And so there are great examples in some of the tools that I'm gonna share with you shortly on how to build out 
um, additional staffing, additional roles um, for folks who can really provide a focused and dedicated approach to leading wellness initiatives for our adults on campus. Um, and particularly a lot of the lingo or languaging would be around school employees um, and school employee wellness programs. And that's not an add-on. It's not an add-on to a job that's already happening, like a school counselor's job. Um, but thinking about how do we make that a dedicated um, position so that the adults on campus are getting responsive and supportive and inclusive um, climate and culture initiatives. So again, I do see that we have folks kind of touching on all of, of our staff here. We may want to give a thought to how certified versus classified staff are being engaged because I can tell you that whether it's a teacher, a librarian, a bus driver, custodial staff, um, cafeteria staff, um, any of our um, uh, campus patrols or monitors, um, all of us, all of us collectively as the community can benefit um, from school-wide wellness initiatives. And so making sure that we are creating accessible opportunities is going to be what we talk about next. Um, and so let me, oops, sorry, we went backwards. We're really going forwards. Um, let's take a look at these three key practices. So this is where I'm going to drill down. Okay, I'm going to drill down and give you actual tools and resources that you can walk away with um, to address your, um, to either start building or expand on this positive school climate and school culture as a strategy for school-wide wellness. Okay? And we know that there are three components to that. Um, so let me talk you through them briefly and then I'll start handing off the tools. Um, so we talked about, um, let's see, um, what you can do in, so sorry, in part one, which was last week, we talked about what you can do. We talked about that self-care element. And this is the kind of component of it where we're shifting to that collective care model, right? So what can we do collectively to boost compassion resilience? How can we engage colleagues in promoting these strategies? Um, and then using this lens to build a collective care practice for all of our adults on campus. Um, when we think about data-driven approaches to wellness, what we're talking about is having current and local information um, about adults on campus. That could be staff, partners, contractors, parents. Um, and that can come in the form of both formal and informal sources. Okay, So that doesn't have to mean that you're doing yet another survey and crunching yet some more numbers. It can be as informal as conversations in the hallway, right? Or before or after a staff meeting or in-service day. Um, but making sure that you're developing and maintaining responsive wellness approaches is the only thing that's going to build resilience in a meaningful way. That's going to lead to those outcomes that we saw around um, reduced turnover, reduced absenteeism, um, better outcomes for our students, better morale of our staff. Uh, and so what I mean by that is using information, using data to make your, ch your choices about the wellness practices you're engaging in. Not doing what feels good to you um, because it's warm and fuzzy or you saw it on a TV show. Not doing what your colleague, um, you know, two states over is raving about or not what you saw as like a TikTok trend, but actually gathering some information and some input to help drive where you're focusing your energy on your, your employee wellness programming um, or your school-wide wellness programming. And that is an ongoing cycle. Right. So just because you collected information once doesn't mean that that's still accurate. So this constant feedback loop so that you can refine and revise and that the wellness activities or strategies that you're engaged in are really going to be responsive to the need and likely to result in the outcome that you're looking for. The next piece is around consistent policies and procedures for wellness. So that's clear and accessible communication and documentation. It's steady implementation transparent feedback loops that support a trauma-informed wellness approach, right? So just as an example of what we mean by consistent policies and procedures, that doesn't mean like it's one and done or, hey, we picked this one, so we're sticking with it. What it means is that you are being consistent in, your, in how you show up. So it's a cohesive strategic approach that's data-driven. If you're trying out some different policies and procedures because you're not sure what's going to work or you're not sure what's going to um, be most effective in your current landscape, 
um, making sure that you're communicating about that, letting your staff know like, hey, we're going to try it like this for a while, but we're not, you know, it's going to be a six month trial and then we're going to evaluate and we may need to try something else um, to either grow and adapt or to make sure that we're finding the best fit for our entire school community. So again, being really clear and open about what the process is um, so that folks feel a sense of agency and feel a sense of predictability um, in what they're gonna be experiencing and that they know they can count on leadership to keep them in the loop. And then the last piece is around effective strategies, which I know feels like a no brainer, but I just wanna say that there's actual research, right? So looking for the research and the culturally supported wellness practices, right? Going on intuition, chasing shiny objects because there's funding attached to it, um, taking what's given to you because someone shows up and says, I'll do this for you if you let me in the door. Um, I mean, that might work, but it's more, it's more of a gamble. And so if we're really kind of trying to be very um, effect efficient, right? And I know we're all trying to be so efficient because we have so much to do. Um, just taking a brief moment um, to look at what the research shows us are effective wellness practices. And I'm gonna share some of them with you now. Um, let's go ahead and move forward. I'm gonna give you um, effective tools for each of those three practices. But before I do, for any of you who are like, listen, it's coming up on the hour, I gotta go, give me something. I wanna share this one global resource, right? This is like, if you just need a one-stop shop for addressing um, school-wide wellness with adults on campus, I want you to go ahead and take a look um, at this toolkit for school employee wellness. Um, again, it's free, um, it's available online. Uh, Kelly just put the link um, in there for you and I wanna talk a little bit about, um, Let's see, I just wanna be mindful of the time. I wanna talk a little bit about um, what's in here. So I'm gonna skip ahead and talk about, they have definitions of what we mean by wellness, school employee wellness. They have actual indicators and metrics. They also have some really important recommendations around equitable access to wellness on campus for our adults. So if those two things really matter to you, um, they have good definitions, but I wanna just highlight for you that it's broken down it kind of works with the whole school, whole child uh, framework. If any of you are familiar with that, it's a holistic approach um, and, and maps on well um, to that CDC um, whole school, whole child model. And in the toolkit, you have individual sections where you can jump in and look at establishing support for, um, for school, school staff wellness, engaging key partners, uh, taking action, so implementation planning to improve school employee wellness, and then creating a culture and climate for school employee wellness. And in each of those sections, there are tip sheets, there are um, particular tools, and there are links to additional resources. And I mentioned this before, earlier in the session where I said, there's an actual dollar value that is attached to school employee or um, school-wide well-being. And in this is one of the places I found it. Um, it's a return on investment generator. It's so cool. And so you can, um, and Kelly, I think you put that link in the chat for me also. Um, it's the return on investment um, called Step, um, Step Well. And you put in your own school data uh, and then it can, can provide a return on investment in your wellness strategies based on things that you might care about like absenteeism of staff. Um, or healthcare um, costs of your employees. Uh, and so that's just one example of what you can find in this resource, but there's so much more. It's really practical. If you can only do one thing, take a look at this one. Um, and I do wanna drill down and look at what we can do in each of these three other areas when we think about um, data-driven decisions, consistent procedures and policies, um, and then uh, effective strategies. So I'm gonna cover those three um, and give you, again, concrete tools that you can easily access, no cost, and then easily implement, really customizable for the bandwidth that you have in the setting that you're in. Before I do that, before I move into the next section, I wanted to just be mindful of the time. I am not encouraging anyone to leave, but in our, um, in our spirit of being realistic, I know some of you might need to drop off on the hour and I'm gonna remind you to please complete the GIPRA. That's the survey that SAMHSA, our funder, asks us to ask you to complete. And having as many of those completed as possible allows us to continue to offer these no-cost learning opportunities to you. 
Um, so Kelly, if you want to drop that in the chat, we do have a bunch more content. So stick around if you can, please. Um, I want to make sure that we're all kind of um, moving forward in our ability to implement around school-wide wellness. So let's take a look. Oops, my bad, sorry. Let's take a look at um, the three resources for practicing school-wide wellness. Um, yeah, okay. So um, the first one I want to talk about is from PBIS. For those of you who are using multi-tiered systems of support, this may be familiar to you. Um, but basically, it's a suite of school climate surveys, right? So if you are like, just tell me what I need to do, um, and you want to get information from a variety of sources, these are um, available at no cost to you. You can implement them for um, measuring the perspective of students, of teachers, of administrators, of faculty, um, and of family. So you pick you know, who you want to get information from. Like I said, you don't have to do it all. You can, maybe you know, based on the poll that I gave you earlier, like, ooh, we need to beef it up over here and get some um, more inclusion of our community partners or more involvement from our parents. So we want to collect some information on what their experience with school has been and what their recommendations are for shaping a climate where they can be more supported. Um, so these are um, available also in Spanish if you need. And so I wanted to just highlight that as your grab and go, um, really easy to use and PBIS supports um, the interpretation of the data that comes back in. The other tool that I wanted to mention to you is called Wellbeing. Um, it's, sorry, this is gonna go for our, cre our tool for creating consistent policies and procedures on campus. Okay. And so this is called the School Climate Improvement Action Guide, um, and it's from the National Center of Safe and Supportive Learning Environments. Um, and it's designed specifically for district leaders and school leaders, instructional staff, non-instructional staff, families, students, community partners. Okay, so we covered all the bases there, every adult, um, and gives you an action guide um, with steps for how to support school climate improvement and tips on what it looks like when it's done well. It also talks you through some of the pitfalls. So learn from other people's mistakes. You don't need to remake them on your own. Uh, and then it also gives you questions to use to kind of get your process starting. So if you're looking for templates, if you're looking for concrete examples, if you're looking for case studies, um, take a look uh, at this action guide and it can really either get you started or it can kind of move you along wherever you are. Uh, and then I'm going to move on to our effective strategies. Okay. I'm going to go deeper on all of these, but I just wanted to highlight three grab and goes for each of these practices. And the last one is around effective strategies. I talked about this a little bit last week, but I want to spend a little bit more time on it. Um, it has to do with social emotional learning. Right? So a lot of times when we're talking about social emotional learning, who are we talking about? We're talking about our students. Right? We're talking about the curriculum that we use for our students to build their social emotional development. Um, and so what we're doing here is flipping that around and saying, you know what might also be really helpful is investing and building the social emotional development of our adults on campus. I think you heard me say earlier in the session that what we want on campus is adults who are emotionally regulated and accessible uh, to support our young people in their learning. And so part of that, when we think about norming, right? Norming our practices together as adults on campus, it's not just so much as creating a culture where we have the uh, bandwidth, we have the compassion resilience to greet each other and make eye contact, um, but it's also about giving adults the opportunity um, to participate in a model of social emotional learning that builds respect, that builds trust, that builds that communication style that's gonna shape a culture that will naturally kind of create those collective supports, that collective resilience, and then infuse a collective care model. And so um, one of the resources that I wanna share with you is from Panorama Education. It's a free resource that allows you to integrate into school settings such as meetings um, and other kind of in-services or other environments. And you can engage adults in the social emotional learning. It's adult specific SEL, right? And again, a lot of it is grab and go. Um, so just kind of how do you start a meeting? How do you end a meeting? Um, 
kind of different practices that adults can use to build their own sense of groundedness and connection to one another. And we know that the research shows again and again that those positive relationships between adults on campus is one of the key elements to a successful school-wide wellness initiative, um, both for all the adults and all the students. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that before we end today. But we have a little bit of time left together. Um, and so I'm gonna go a little bit deeper on each of these. So as I mentioned at the front end, if you're like, hey, I'm multitasking right now, just give me the goods. Um, you have the global resource, you have a resource for data-driven wellness, you have a resource for um, consistent, and poli consistent policies and procedures for wellness, and you have a resource for effective strategies on wellness. So I'm handing you those four, and I'm gonna go ahead and move us forward to look a little bit more deeply at each of those three practices that I mentioned. So let's take a look at data first. So I mentioned the school climate survey suite um, from PBIS. I wanted to offer you one other resource in case that one doesn't suit your needs. Um, and that's the compendium of school climate measures. So that is exactly what it sounds like, a collection of all kinds of school climate measures. So different languages, some are free, some are not free, um, but it puts it all together and kind of gives you a description um, of what the survey or the data collection uh, method might offer you. And within that, there are all different kinds of examples. So if you're gonna tell me, hey, I cannot ask my staff to do one more survey. Okay, don't, I get it. Um, there's examples in there of how you can gather data using listening tours, um, how you can engage adults, adults in solution as solution seekers for the needs and issues that they see on campus. So it's not just um, getting together and complaining, um, but really getting together, identifying what are the priority issues and using the adults on campus as kind of a feedback loop and as a brainstorming team to really identify, okay, what would work better? What would work differently? What do we wanna try? Um, and then also gives you some tools for systematically integrating feedback from adults engaged on campus. Um, so again, what we really did was curate um, tools that we felt like were going to be effective and simple and accessible for you. So I don't wanna add more to your list, but if you're interested in making some more informed choices about school-wide um, wellness initiatives, then use any of these to kind of dial it in a little bit. Um, I don't wanna overwhelm you. I wanna go for the low-hanging fruit here and say, you know, if it's just uh, those more informal ways of collecting data, the Compendium of School Climate Measures offers some of those examples. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and move us forward um, and take a look at our next practice. So there's three, we're moving on to number two, which is policy and procedure for wellness. Um, so I gave you one of these resources already, the Wellbeing um, School Climate Improvement Action Guides um, for leadership and staff. So that is just an abundance of really cool um, tips and strategies that you can use. I wanted to offer this other um, tool that I recently, a toolkit that I recently discovered that I am just really enjoying. Um, it's kind of a different style than I've seen uh, in some of the other toolkits or guides that are out there. It's called the Compassion Resilience Toolkit for Schools. Um, and this one kind of just has a different tone to it. So if you're looking for something that's more holistic and more encompassing, uh, it provides, again, really concrete and actionable templates, tools, models, um, but comes at it from a really well-rounded um, set of approaches. And so I wanted to just highlight that if you're looking at um, strategies for policy and procedures that might fit with the climate and culture you have or the climate and culture you're striving for on campus, take a look at the Compassion Resilience Toolkit. Um, some of the examples from there are around dedicated planning time and dedicated collaboration time. So making that distinction um, for staff on campus, we know that collaboration across staff is one of the um, key contributors to positive school climate and school culture and therefore school wellness. Um, so really thinking about how do we create policies and procedures that um, make collaboration part of the routine. Uh, another example is around mentorship and professional development opportunities. Uh, and so thinking about policies and procedures that are gonna support that and help our um, school staff and adults on campus feel a sense of connectedness to one another, as well as a connectedness to their meaning and purpose. 
And then they also have some examples for how to establish norms and collective responsibility for each other um, and for students. So really great resource if you're looking for um, ways to develop your policies and procedures that are trauma-informed, wellness-focused. Uh, okay, and then I'm gonna move us on to our third practice, and this is effective strategies. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, there's a lot of folks who feel like they know what should be happening. Um, and there's a lot of kind of culturally um, proven and research driven strategies that we know have outcomes for wellness. And so I'm encouraging you all to do just a brief dive. If you don't have too much time, I'm offering you two strategies right here. Um, and, or sorry, two resources around the strategy of adult social emotional learning. Okay, so that's the strategy that I selected to focus on and I'm giving you two resources for it. Um, and I wanted to give you just a really concrete example. This one comes from Castle. Um, if you do any social emotional learning, you probably know Castle because they do so much of our content for our um, student focused social emotional learning, but they also have cool tools for adult SEL. Um, and one of them is the three signature SEL practices for adult learning. And this is a really popular one. And you might be able to already say, hey, we're doing this, great. Um, if not, it's a really simple and free way that you can shift some of the norms for engagement of adults on campus. Any activity where you're bringing adults on campus together, start with a welcoming activity. That could be a really brief community builder. It could be a really long community builder, but a welcoming activity, right? A lot of us are just crunched for time, right? We're jumping right into any session and we don't have a sense of how the person next to us is doing. Um, but creating a, even just a brief pause for a collective breath together um, can really start changing um, the sense of culture on campus. Um, having engaging practices, right? So even just taking pause for there to be some dyad work between adults in a meeting can be really impactful. And then an optimistic closing. Um, so words of hope is a really um, easy closer where you're asking people, what are they walking away with? Um, what hopes do they have moving forward? Um, and that could be something that they write on a post-it note and put on um, the message of hope wall. It could be something that they say aloud. So again, kind of thinking about your circumstances, thinking about your resources and adapting these practices um, are really flexible and also effective in really shaping the culture of how adults are engaging or connecting to each other on campus. Um, so just taking a look at our time, um, we've covered the resources for, well, we've had the global resource if you just want a one-stop shop. And then we've covered um, at least two resources for each of our three um, wellness practices. And I want to just kind of bring it all together with a focus on how are we resourcing wellness? Um, so we know, um, we know that we can kind of build and build a sense of wellness, build our compassion resilience. And when we do so, there's research that shows that when we have adults who can recognize, understand, label, express, and regulate their own emotions, when they can build that reservoir, as we described it, a reservoir of compassion resilience, that our adults on campus are less likely to burn out. They have higher levels of relational trust with their peers at work. It lays the foundation for productive collaboration. It improves their individual well being, their social, emotional, and academic outcomes of our students. So, these practices with adults not only benefit the adults, but benefit the young people on campus. Um, we know that um, adults who are experiencing this on campus have higher levels of patience and empathy. They encourage healthy communication and create safe learning environments for students. They effectively teach and model social emotional competence for students. They build and maintain stronger relationships with students, which leads to improved classroom management and fewer disciplinary problems. It also contributes um, to the overall school climate, as we discussed, um, and results in um, a sense of greater principal support, higher job satisfaction, and a sense of personal accomplishment. Okay. And so these are um, some of the benefits that we get from using these three practices and building our collective care model. Um, and I wanted to land in 
on a particular resource that I hope this is my ending with a positive um, with a positive outlook, right? So we're working under hard circumstances. We want a realistic assessment of the stressors and the barriers that our adults on campus are facing. And we wanna connect them to what we know works, right? And as we're building our school-wide wellness, I wanted to share another um, kind of a deep bench of information, if you're not familiar with it already. Um, it's from researcher Dr. Sean Accor. Um, and Dr. Sean Accor focuses his research on um, happiness. And I wanna just pause there because a lot of people have strong reactions to that word when, I, when it is said. Um, I'm gonna define happiness, how Sean Accor defines happiness, which is in terms of connection, in terms of meaning, in terms of um, purpose, in terms of gratitude, um, in terms of contentment. Um, so we're not talking about like giddy, joy, nonstop um, Disneyland types of scenarios. We're talking about realistic and grounded sense of fulfillment. And the thing I like about Dr. Accor's research is that he's doing it in the context of education. Um, he is the adult child of two teachers. And so he has a very good sense um, of the educational setting. And he's taken a lot of his research on what promotes a sense of success and a sense of happiness in the workplace into the education realm. And I wanted to share some specific resources that he offers for those of us who are working in educational settings. Um, and so it's called The Power of Happiness for Educators. I'm gonna share, if you just have like a few seconds, there's a really quick blog where he is outlining or kind of mapping out some of the key principles. If you have about half an hour in two 15 minute chunks, there's a really, we're gonna watch a snippet of it in a minute, but there's a really great YouTube video. Um, and if you wanna go into a deep dive, either of these resources that Kelly's putting in the chat link to um, Sean Accor's work, um, as well as some of the programming and initiatives that he offers for schools to use as a means of building the school-wide wellness um, and really kind of building that reservoir. And even, I'm gonna just say it one more time, um, increasing the levels of happiness, not only of our adults on campus, um, but for our adults off campus, as well as our students. Um, and so there's this ripple effect that he talks about. Um, and so uh, I wanna talk, before we I show the video of him talking about this in the context of education, I wanna share some of the key practices. And as I mentioned, um, these are all intended to be kind of the high level overview. You can get deeper information about how to integrate any of these um, from the links that Kelly put in the chat. So the first one I've already alluded to, um, when we talk about using any of this research, this idea of irrational optimism, right? Or Disneyland level happiness um, can feel like a barrier where you're already like, nope, Got, I already got what I wanted, Christina. If you're going to start talking about happiness and education, I'm out of here. Um, so again, I've been trying throughout this session to really anchor us in this idea of realistic assessment of what is good and what is hard. Um, and, and that way, we're kind of using what Dr. Accor puts forward as this um, unhappiness or frustration as a catalyst for change, right? And that the flip side of happiness in education is not unhappiness. Um, unhappiness is our motivator. Knowing what's not working is going to motivate us to transform and to change. What we're working against, what we want to avoid in education is, is apathy. Um, and so a lot of his resources talk about apathy as being the enemy of the good in education. Um, when we think about just, I'm going to move us down to the next practice. Um, we know, so he has, we have Research that shows Dr. Accor, as well as other um, corroborating researchers show that things like scanning for the positive, right? So we know bad things are happening, um, but let's take a look around us and see what's going well. Um, identifying what we're grateful for and expressing gratitudes and appreciations. I saw some of you contribute that um, earlier in the session today, and that's right on. Uh, we know that that really supports a culture of connection and wellness when we can really see each other um, for the value that we are having in any given moment uh, with our students or for each other on campus. And then those opportunities to connect to meaning. We talked about that in really practical way today in terms of professional development or mentorship, but there's lots of ways that we can help our adults on campus connect to their why, connect to their sense of um, motivation uh, for showing up in the work. 
And then the last one is really about activating an ecosystem. So Dr. Akor's research really spends a lot of time talking about the benefits of social connection, including our connection to each other on campus as vital to promoting wellness. Um, and um, that all of our, that we're kind of building the wellness, not only of our self, but of all of our campus community members. Um, and so I wanted to just land on one key piece of his research that says, um, if we raise the levels of social connection, of gratitude, of meaning or purpose, right? So in a, he kind of encapsulates that as happiness. If we raise the levels of happiness, but that's what he means by that connection, gratitude, meaning, purpose. Only then did we see students educational outcomes improve. So adults on campus, their level of happiness in any of those categories are directly tied to student outcomes. And there's another piece to it. This, is, this one was the kicker. Um, that while students' performance improved and levels of happiness rose for educators, that even those folks who were not involved in the direct initiative to raise happiness saw increases in their wellness scores. So um, parents and guardians off campus, their wellness scores also increased when there was well-being for adults on campus. Um, and so I think that's really powerful testimony to why these types of um, so school-wide well-being initiatives are incredibly valuable. Um, I wanna just um, see if I can queue up a video before we end today, and then we will shift gears Let's see if I can go ahead and get this started. We go. I'm gonna fast forward us to the part that I really wanna make sure you hear. Give me just a moment. All right. Here we go. Our friend to your life. And what we're finding in this research continually as we measure it is that if the teachers don't feel a sense of meaning and purpose, they leave before two years. So you're not getting a great mm -hmm. education, right? It's good as if they were staying there and learning more and more. So if we could raise, if we started with the teachers and the educators and the staff, if we raise the levels of gratitude and optimism by doing these very simple positive psychology habits, it turns out they stay longer, they uh, feel more engaged with their work, they're able to ripple this positive change back to, out to their students, right? The, the stress levels drop for the students, but then, if you're able to get this into the classrooms, it turns out that as we've been measuring these things worldwide, um, what we've been finding is incredible things. We took a, a bottom 10% school in the United States and brought their graduation rates up to 91%. That happens when you start to actually create optimism and positivity because positive education yields those higher outcomes mm -hmm. on the backside of it. And I, I like this, this sense of um, building a sense of efficacy that you know, that we can make a difference. We're grateful for you spending time with us today and sharing your. All right, so I just wanted to make sure we were ending with a message of hope that change is possible, um, including through some really kind of um, basic ways that we can implement um, school-wide wellness. Uh, we're not gonna have so much time for discussion today. I apologize, I will stay on a little bit longer if folks wanna stick around and discuss, but I wanted to make sure before we wrap today to highlight a couple things. Um, one is additional resources. So as I mentioned, um, this session today, last week's session is part of a bigger series that we've been doing around creating cultures of staff wellness and care for our schools and community. So if you would like um, some, access to the um, sessions that we've done in the past, as well as some training videos that we've done around self-care and collective care practices. Um, please use these links to find it at the Southeast MHTTC Resource Library. Um, and then I also wanted to make sure that we were holding some time together today to complete this evaluation. So again, um, we are able to bring you these opportunities through funding from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration and the Southeast MHTTC counts on you to complete these surveys. Again, less than two minutes if you have it. Um, Kelly's gonna put the link in the chat. Take five minutes now um, to just go through that and it allows us to continue to offer these um, when we give this feedback to SAMHSA and they can see that it's being well received. Um, so. I'm gonna pause there and make sure that you have time to go ahead and complete that survey. 
Um, I'm also going to take a look through the chat to see if there's any questions um, or if folks want to raise their hand and unmute and ask a question. We do have a few minutes for that as well. And Kelly, as folks are um, starting the survey, I also just wanted to ping you. I was tracking lightly in the chat that you were um, being responsive in there. So thanks, Kelly. Thanks, Josie. Um, were there any questions that you felt like I should be aware of and, and address? Not that I see. OK, great. Thank you. I just want to make sure I didn't miss anything. OK, so I'm not seeing any input in the chat right now or any hands raised. Um, I'm going to go ahead and um, close the session for the video recording, but we will keep the session open um, for folks to complete the survey.